Did you know that trying to build aerobic fitness, easy slow runs, and anaerobic fitness, harder faster runs at the same time might be like trying to whisper and shout simultaneously? Sounds impossible, right? But is it? In this episode, we're tackling two major issues that most new and experienced runners face. Can you train for both speed and endurance without sabotaging one or the other? And when it comes to tracking your progress, is all the technology and metric data helping or is it leaving you super confused? We're gonna break down the science of balancing fitness goals and reveal the biggest mistake runners make when it comes to tracking their performance. If you've ever felt stuck between conflicting goals or building aerobic base versus sharpening your top end speed or buried in data, and you don't know how to use it, this episode is for you. But before we get into it, I'll be joined by a good friend, pro certified running coach and exercise scientist with almost half a million followers on Instagram, Mike Trees, aka run.energy, to help answer all these questions. I am Darren, certified running and nutrition coach, sub three hour marathoner and 10 hour Ironman finisher. Since 1996, I've been helping other self coach runners, researching and experimenting on how to better myself 1% each day, because this is the 1% better runner. And we do all of this to help you live an amazing run life. Let's dive into it. Here's a, a random question that I have yet to get the answers from the internet. I love your take on this. I know there's no perfect answer, but Mavatone is big on saying, you know, he goes, you can't build aerobic fitness and anaerobic fitness at the same time. I remember reading this book and I was like, oh, and he's like, don't do hard runs, you know, in your aerobic stage of the 16 weeks, you know, you're going to undo all your aerobic fitness. And I like, I believed it for the first year and I didn't touch it. And then I went to race and I was cramping and everything hurt. And I was like, what's going on? So as I've slowly realized I can, I need to incorporate very fast sprint stuff in my aerobic build period um, and then slowly ramp it up as I start, you know, getting towards race specific work. So is it possible to build both at the same time or is it is it like weight training, you know, weightlifters where they can't they can't lose body fat and gain muscle at the same time? Like they have to have a cut phase and a bulk phase is anaerobic and aerobic fitness. Can you do it at the same time? It depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it depends who you ask is what you get the answer. So the theory you know, in the sense is, yeah, you shouldn't work the aerobic and the anaerobic at the same time. But we're living in the real world as well. Uh, and and I, I, found, I think that so long as you do a little bit of speed work, you're not going to take the, end off, the edge off that aerobic engine. So, yeah, I, I adhere to the principle in, in principle. So I adhere to the principle in principle that we should do at least 10 weeks of aerobic training with no anaerobic training in there. However, what I also realize is that you can do some alactic work, which is based on the ATP system, uh, which for anyone who, who doesn't know, the ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the initial energy stored in the muscles. That happens before we go anaerobic. So if we keep the sprint short, you know, seven to 10 seconds, take long rests between, we can get the leg speed work doing we can actually get used to running quick without developing lactic acid so it's not blocking the aerobic receptors and and prohibiting the uh the aerobic development so we can put that within an easy run so i quite like doing those sort of things but also we have to be practical that yeah you come off this aerobic base and need to go into racing i don't adhere to absolutely smashing it with intervals on the track six four hundreds big rest you know, see, can you do, you know, maximum time in that aerobic peak? But I quite like the VO2 max work and, and the 5K fits that perfectly. That 15 to 20, you know, for the elites, the 15 to 20 minute zone, but basically a 50, you know, a 5K effort where you're probably running mostly aerobic the whole way. And you're just dipping in a little bit of anaerobic stuff in you know, the last two or three K to get you to the end. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so marginal that, yeah, you, you'll be a little bit sore the next day. Once a week, it's not going to take anything off the aerobic engine. So I, I've come to the conclusion that, yes, we try not to, but I get the best results out of doing a big aerobic base, but making sure there's one good solid workout <laughs> a week and there's one nice leg speed work in there a week. So that, that would be my take on it. I, I like that. They, um, thank you for explaining. Um, just to define to the listeners, and it would be really interesting to um, – to hear your take. So just so people know, anaerobic isn't actually just all out sprinting. That's the ATP creatine system that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, creatine is actually just like five seconds um, power. Um, yeah. And aerobic is actually much larger than people. People, a lot of people think um, aerobic is easy and anaerobic is absolutely sprinting, you know, for 20, 30 seconds up a hill. Whereas 
anaerobic is actually more of like the longer tempo and threshold type work. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So, and it's, and it's how long you stay there and how long your heart rate's in there, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Future Darren here, and I won't do that thing. You know the thing where people go, hey, you should subscribe, rate, share, give a thumbs up, rah, 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 rah. Now, while I'd love for you to do that anyways, please go ahead and do it. The next steps will be for you to transform your running life with our free 1% Better Runner, 30-day base training habits plan, and newsletter. Unlike other running plans and newsletters, we do not do motivational quick fixes and hacks. Instead, we focus on long-term success that lasts from 30 days to 30 years and more. It's not just a training plan, but a mental shift. Think of it as your personal running therapist. Sign up for free at either dlitcreates.com forward slash news, web search 1% better runner newsletter, or get the link in the show notes or video description below. All value, no fluff, cancel anytime. Let's get back into it. And it's how long you stay there and how long your heart rate's in there. Is that correct? The, the simplest way of explaining it is that anaerobic means without oxygen, aerobic means with oxygen. And, and when you run, if you run at a pace that's slow enough, you supply all the oxygen needs to your muscles as you breathe, and it's with oxygen. At short periods of time, you know, when we were hunters and gatherers, we had to escape. So we've got this fight and flight mechanism. We can survive for up to two minutes without oxygen in the muscles. Uh, and it produces energy from the stored uh, energy in the muscles. But the byproduct of that is something called lactate, uh, and that builds up in the muscles. Uh, and so the, the problem, once the lactic builds up in the muscles, it prevents oxygen from getting into the muscles. So therefore, we have to slow down. So if you go fast for a short period, the payback, as we all know, in real terms is, wow, my legs are burning. I can't breathe anymore. I've got to slow down. And that's because we've used too much uh, anaerobic energy and built up too much lactic. But people think there's this threshold, and they call it AT work, anaerobic you know, threshold. They're on the borderline between aerobic and anaerobic. It's not a line. It's, it's a, a zone. And imagine that the simplest way to explain it to people is imagine that it's snowing, but it's above freezing and the ground's quite warm. The snow comes down and the snow hits the ground and it melts. There's no snow on the ground. That's where most people are running. They're in that aerobic zone with a little bit of lactic building up, but the body's so efficient, it's reabsorbing it and it's not building up. So it's snowing, but there's no snow building up. Then all of a sudden, a big storm comes down. That's you picking the pace up, and it snows really hard, and the snow starts to accumulate quicker than it can melt. So it's still above freezing. The snow is melting, but it's building up quicker than it's melting. That's the lactic building up in your muscles. So if you think of it like that, it's a little bit easier to explain. There is no one line. It's not, I'm aerobic, I'm anaerobic. It's a gray area. Uh, and in general, in base training, we want to keep as far away from that as we can. Uh, and if, when you're doing anaerobic work, you obviously want to go over that line and work it as much as we can. And the idea is that we can more efficient uh, and can run at a quicker pace without going anaerobic. Uh, and so that's the point of doing training where you, you work, work this threshold. You try and on a graph deflect the graph to the right so we can run at a faster pace, but still stay aerobic. What do you think is the biggest issue that new and experienced runners deal with in, in particular, tracking their metrics? So, like, you know, we, we've spoken a bit about the theories behind it all, but a lot of new runners, they come in, they don't know exactly what to do. So wh what do you think the biggest issue is with heart rate and the, you know, all that stuff? The biggest issue is a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. So everyone has a little bit of knowledge, but really don't understand the bigger picture. So the bigger picture is forget the heart rate monitor, forget the watch, forget everything. It's what are you trying to achieve? Uh, are you trying to achieve running just for fun? Do you just want to run with your friends and be sociable? Do you want to be world champion? Do you want to, do you want to finish a marathon? Do you want to finish a marathon in a set time? Do you want to run a 1500? You need to know what your goal is, why you're doing it. And most people sort of, when I ask them, they haven't really thought about this. Uh, and so that's the first problem. The second problem with all this, they suddenly, we then define their goals and they say, yeah, I want to run, I'm going to say this just simply, I want to run a sub three hour marathon. I say, okay, that's a challenging goal. Where are we now? Let's look at the starting point and how do we get there before we even get onto any metrics. Then I say to them, this is what we'll need to do. 
the next thing is we need to fit this into your life cycle. So there's no point in thinking how are you going to train and do everything if you've got a sick mother you have to look after uh, and work, or if your job is 12 hours a day. So everything has to fit in. We have to look at all the external factors playing. Are you a student that has to pass your exams first? Then we might say, okay, that's more realistic. You've got to get through those exams. So maybe the marathon isn't so good now. Maybe let's look at something simpler uh, and get a different goal. So we then define our goal and what's realistic within their social, academic, and financial uh, lifestyle. Uh, and so it can fit into a daily pattern. Then we can come to, do they need a, a watch? Do they need to start looking at the metrics and where they're going? So we, we start to look at, at how fit they are, where they need to go. And I, I think you don't need that watch yet. You, if, as you said right at the start, I don't know if it's going to be cut out or not, but the point is, you know, they, when, when they start training, there's so much that they just have to run and they're going to get quicker. So my thing is just get them running, but also get them running at a sustainable level that they're not going to be running for three weeks then injured and miss three weeks. So let's get a sustainable build-up pattern. Uh, and then let's start adding complexity along the line. So it never gets easier. They just get more in, in tune with their own bodies and able to cope with more work and more metrics and more knowledge. So I don't want to be saying, let's have a look at your cadence to a, to a runner who's just starting. I'll just get them to run and I'll happily look at their cadence and say, well, it's near, near enough, there or thereabouts. Let's forget about that one for now and look at something else. Uh, are they overstriding? Are they they landing really badly? Let's work on on some form things that we need to work on. Let's look at the most important things. So the metrics come last. Uh, too many people are into IT these days. They're into the gadgets. And I, to be honest, I love them as well. I love looking at it, but it's just for me, it's a fun little thing that I like looking at. It's not serious. And I posted about how smart watches give me a VO2 max of 70. Well, that just confuses most people because I'll tell them to do an aerobic run and the metric on the smartwatch actually don't count <laughs> aerobic runs to build up their VO2. They, they just count zone three. They just look at the heart rate and say, have you been in zone three for how long? Yes, your VO2 max is going up. Have you been in zone one too much? Oh, your VO2 is going down. Uh, so they often don't understand how the metrics work on the smartwatches and it, it, it confuses them. Uh, and the, the smartwatches totally overestimate the metrics. It gives me one of 70, for example. Whereas when I had a, uh, a VO2 of 70, I was running 345 for the 1500 meters. Uh, and 70 is actually classified as an, a sub-international runner. So you're on the borders of just about getting international status running, which is what I was. Uh, Derek Clayton at a VO2 max of 69 broke the marathon world record. So there's so much in these metrics that are meaningless, but interesting. Uh, and but I think the main metric to have a little bit of an idea on it is heart rate, just to understand it, to where you're going. That's the first one to get into, uh, if I had to pick one metric. Uh, and, and start to learn about your body and your heart rate. Time, time, time. I'm obsessed with it as it's the one thing we can't make more of. But ironically, we as humans, we made the whole concept of time. Thanks for giving us your time by listening, watching, or reading this. We love helping runners get 1% better each day, one step at a time, and can only reach more runners by people like you sharing this out to runners like you. As I might have mentioned earlier in the episode, if you haven't already, you can get a free step-by-step 30-day -step base training and habits guide to getting 1% better in running and life each day by signing up for our email newsletter. Unlike other running videos and podcasts, we are not about the quick hack and fluffy motivational quotes. Instead, the 1% Better Runner focuses on how small daily habits ripple into broader life success, helping runners perform better on and off the road or the trail or the track, wherever you want to be doing your workouts, all in five minutes per week. This episode and all this content is produced in Sydney, Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional indigenous custodians of this land. Much, much, much respects. If you want to contact us about anything, email talk at delaycreates.com. We're also on the socials, mainly Instagram and Strava right now. Just search One Better Run or Delake Runs. Small steps now, lifelong impact later. Peace.